Back when I was a wannabe entrepreneur, I can remember thinking, wow, if I were to die today and look back on what I've achieved, I wouldn't, whilst I've had a great career, I wouldn't personally be proud of anything that I've done. So Olio is an app that is tackling the problem of waste in our modern society. Specifically, right now, we're really focused on food waste. Um, and we do that by connecting people who have food that they don't want or need with their neighbours living nearby who would like it. It's a really social good idea. How do you make money in it? So we started generating revenues just under two years ago. And we do that because we have something called our Food Waste Heroes programme. And that essentially is a service that we offer to businesses whereby our trained up volunteers will collect and redistribute the unsold food from those local businesses at the end of the day. So instead of them paying a waste contractor to take that food off the landfill where it gives off methane and destroys the planet, instead they pay us and we ensure that food is fully redistributed and enjoyed and eaten by the local community. So that's how we started monetizing and then we have a number of other revenue opportunities that we are investigating as we speak. Wonderful. I know you personally are very passionate about sustainability and the environment. Yes. Um, tell me why, personally, before we talk about the business. Yeah. Well, um, to be honest, the two are very much intertwined. So I was brought up on a farm and I think when you live in a very rural environment, you do have a really keen appreciation for nature and the planet and, and, and the world and stuff like that. But I had absolutely no clue about the true state of the world and the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the resource depletion crisis, until I started working on OVO. Um, and the, my first sort of indication that we have an enormous problem was when I'd had this experience of moving country and I had some food that um, we couldn't eat. The removal men said I had to throw it away. I wasn't prepared to do that. And so I set out into the streets to try and find someone to share some food with. I failed. And that was where I had the idea for Olio. But then the next thing I did was to start researching the problem of food waste. And through that experience, I just had my eyes opened. I was absolutely horrified about the world that we're living in. And very briefly, globally, a third of all the food we produce gets thrown away each year. Meanwhile, there are 800 million people who go to bed hungry each night who could be fed in a quarter of the food we throw away in the Western world. And then environmentally, food waste is devastating. If it were to be a country with the third largest source of greenhouse gas emissions after the USA and China. And then I discovered that half of all food waste takes place in the home. And actually only 2% of all food waste takes place at a retail store level. So that means that we're half the problem. And so it's through going through that journey of learning and exploration, just about food waste specifically, it just really opened my eyes to what is actually going on in the world around us. And then once you start on that journey and you start seeing waste, you then see it absolutely everywhere. And that then sort of segued me into just really getting passionate about understanding how our society exists and how we sort of consume resources and the extent to which it just isn't sustainable, unfortunately. Do you think it's a behavior problem? Um, do you think it's a systematic issue with institutions? Is the problem both bottom up and top down? It is both bottom up and top down. Um, we are in a, a very, very frustrating sort of catch-22 situation at the moment, which is that the institutions won't respond until people, us, until we start demanding it. Um, and we're saying that we can't respond because people aren't providing us with the products and the services that we want to be able to lead a sustainable life. Um, I also think that we have very, very deep systemic problems with capitalism as it's currently constructed. Um, you know, at the moment, everyone, everyone's North Star metric is growth mm -hmm. and we cannot have infinite and perpetual growth when we live on one planet with very, very finite resources. And so there's lots of very deep thinking and change that needs to take place around our economic systems and how we govern our societies, how we organize our businesses, what we focus on, all the way through to us as individuals. I'm really excited about the power of individuals because you know, very simplistically, it was billions of small actions that got us into this mess in the first place. And so almost by definition, billions of small actions can get us out of it. And if you look at the climate crisis specifically, 60% of all greenhouse gas emissions 
are generated as a direct result of household consumption. So that means that if we actually start to rethink our relationship with consumption and just rethink how we consume, then we can have an enormous effect on the biggest problem facing humanity today. Some very interesting points there. And um, you, I'll pick you on a few of those. Yeah. Um, as a startup, you are deeply embedded in nine out of 10 companies that will fail for one to win in the VC structure. Mm -hmm. How does Olio, when they do their scaling up or they present to VCs, do you find because of your business mindset, you have to be picky who you get in bed with as an investor? Yeah, so we are very considered about who we work with, um, not just investors, but in general, in general, but definitely in terms of investors. So we, we have a really important threshold, which is that anyone who joins Olio has to be not just mission aligned, but mission obsessed. And they have to buy into our long-term vision for the business, which is an unashamedly bold one. It's of a world where we have billions of people who are connected hyper-locally in their local communities to share our most precious resources instead of tossing them in the bin. And so we are always very, very carefully selecting investors who have bought into that long-term vision and then who we know can help us and accelerate us on that journey. And then also investors who we're going to enjoy working with, you know, who we have good chemistry with, which is really, really important. How do you see uh, scaling up and how do you define it for a... Well, firstly, what are your thoughts on scaling up? Uh, it's exciting. <laughs> so I, I guess scaling up for me is when you're sort of starting to transition out of that startup phase. So the startup phase, I think, very much is characterised by extremely rapid iterations you don't know the answers to anything. And so your number one job is to test, iterate and learn as quickly as possible. Once you get into the scale up mode, um, you don't have the answers to everything, but you have certain core hypotheses in your business that have already been proven. You've got the data, you know it works. And so now you want to sort of rinse, wash, repeat and grow um, what you're doing. It's scaling up comes with a whole new set of challenges that you didn't have when you were kind of a startup. Um, so I think when you're on this journey sort of end to end, you constantly think when I get to the next peak, things will be easy. And the reality is that just never happens. Um, and you just replace one set of problems and challenges um, with another. But uh, it, it's a very exciting time, I think, to be in an organization's life cycle. You are an entrepreneur and you're clearly very passionate about what you do. What advice would you give to other people who are starting out in the industry? So the first thing piece of advice I would give to anybody is to please just do some reading about the state of the planet and the state of the earth. We are in an existential crisis where genuinely the future of civilization is seriously at risk. And so we need every man, woman and child helping to solve these problems. And so I would say now is a great time. There's no shortage of problems that need solving in the world. So now is a great time to be an entrepreneur, in particular given that large businesses and governments are not moving fast enough. So I would encourage people to investigate in that area to you know, think about when they're, you know, I'm going to spend the next five, 10, 15 years of my life doing this. Um, so let's do something that's going to make a difference. The next thing um, I would encourage people to do is really to, um, well, first of all, actually to read a book called The Lean Startup by Eric Ries, mm -hmm. which if anyone hasn't read it, they absolutely must read it mm -hmm. because that will give you a framework and a way of thinking about how to go from an idea and from inception actually to getting a product out into the market and beyond. Uh, and the other thing that I would encourage any entrepreneur to do is to try and come up with a way to test your core hypothesis for your product or service before you invest a lot of money actually building it. So for us at Olio, we did a proof of concept using WhatsApp. And that, so we essentially put 12 people who via a survey told us they hated food waste. We knew they lived near each other. We put them onto a closed WhatsApp group for two weeks to see if they would share. We then met with them debriefed to understand what that experience was like. And that saved us so much money because if we had built an app 
prior to doing that proof of concept, we would have gone to market with entirely the wrong product. And there are so many existing platforms out there that you can build a prototype or a proof of concept for your product on. So I definitely recommend doing that before you spend um, a lot of money. On That's it. a pro tip right there, because I think what you did there is, is exceptional, um, especially because you the testing that you did was actually live testing. Correct. Yeah. A lot of the times you can test and you have a sample and people just fill out check boxes and mm -hmm. questions. What, what people tell you they will do, what they actually do are to wildly okay. different things and the other recommendation i'd have to that point is to read an amazing book called the mom test which is all about how do you get to the reality of what people are actually going to do not what they're going to tell you that they will okay. do very interesting very interesting um how long have you been running the company four and a half years, four and a half now, years. Yeah. um prior to that were you running another business or yeah, so I had a, I think what could be described as a classic corporate career for about 15 years before founding Olio. So I started my life as a, well, not my life, but my career as a strategy consultant. I then um, moved into industry because I wanted to do stuff, not just strategize about stuff. Uh, and I worked in a variety of industries, including media, retail, and financial services, all of which I was very much focused on the digital part of the business. Mm -hmm. And I was a, a general manager, um, and so I had, I guess, quite a broad skill set. That's very interesting. And um, I always find it's, it's hard to start at any time, but it's even harder when you are in, an, in a cushion. You know, you get paid every, yeah. every, every month. And for you to be mission driven, I think is even harder from there on to leap to actually start your business. I think it's a mental frame. Well, do you know what? I'm going to challenge you a little Go bit on, on that because actually sometimes people say, how did you have the courage or how did you have the confidence? And the answer is I didn't and or we didn't. My co-founder Sasha and I didn't. But what we had found was a problem that was so mind bogglingly enormous. We couldn't see anybody solving it and we couldn't just let that lie. So if you find a really, really significant problem that has to be solved, the problem drags you in um, and it gives you that courage and that conviction to, to take that take that next step. But so you've got to allow yourself to be open to um, like you experienced it. Well, um, I think yeah. so. A lot of people, entrepreneurs, so I, I was probably a wannabe entrepreneur for you know, at least five years before I took that leap. And I spent a lot of time thinking, but I don't have an idea. I don't have an idea. And I meet so many people who say, I don't have an idea. I've now realized that you shouldn't be going around searching for an idea. You should be going around searching for a problem that needs solving. And that's just a very different mindset. So you could just say, I'm going to take 24 hours. And I'm going to have a notebook with me or your phone or whatever. And every single thing that is suboptimal in the world, I'm just going to jot down. And that will give you an enormous number of problems that you could then go about tackling. And that your idea will be generated by selecting a problem that is big enough and that you're interested in and you're passionate about. Beautifully said. Pro number two, there's pro tips. <laughs> She's just firing pro tips at me. That's brilliant. This, this is fantastic. It's, it's like when I was reading a little bit about Elon's, Elon Musk's sort of theory of, uh, for SpaceX, especially how he went about raising money. And yeah, he wants to take us to Mars, but doesn't know how to get there. So he started a rocket company before he gets there. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's very interesting you say that. Uh, Richard Branson talks about writing in the book all the time. I myself have tried to start, I'm highly dyslexic, so I have to write constantly and consistently yeah. to even tell myself that it is really important. Mm -hmm. um, that's very interesting. Um, females in the entrepreneurial world. Is there a difference between male and female in an entrepreneurial sort of setup? Yes. <laughs> in, what do you, do you in, find? In a word. Big, so, yeah. so, the, so the only difference that I have directly experienced mm -hmm. um, and also the data is showing very clearly is when it comes to fundraising. So last year in the UK, only 1% of all venture capital investment went to female founded businesses. 89% went to male founded businesses and the Delta went to mixed teams. That is a massive problem. And the reason why that is a massive problem is because it means that the types of businesses that male founded teams are solving are the, are the problems that are getting funded. 
and wow. there's not enough problems that affect women, half the population, and affect people from different ethnicities and different socioeconomic backgrounds. Those problems are not getting funded, and so they're not getting solved. And so that's why I feel very strongly and very passionately about the importance of us getting diversity in the community who are the gatekeepers of capital. Because at the moment, they're a very homogenous group of people who are investing in solving problems that they can relate to and that they're passionate about. And so too often, we're solving the problem for the 1% and we're not solving the problems of the 99%. Wow, diversity in the community of the gatekeepers of capital. Beautifully said, beautifully said. And I think that's so true. Um, I was reading something around AI and bias programs and selective sort of, uh, the, the funniest one recently, apparently, uh, Steve Wozniak sort of something on Twitter that his wife and he had similar accounts, but his wife got a credit card and he got a credit card and he got pre-approved for a way higher amount than she was, even though they had same funds, same history. Yeah. And um, it's very interesting that even in the code, mm -hmm. um, it's been coded a certain way, even if somebody's trying not to be biased. Our current biases are being coded into the into future. Into the future. And that's, that's a problem. That's very interesting. And being funded by mm -hmm. men who are then funding that 1% of the problem. So all of this is very interesting. And, and I believe mm. that a, at the root of much of our sustainability, climate, biodiversity, resource depletion crises, uh, a big part of why they've come about is again, because we have not had enough diversity in positions of power and the communities that have been affected by the climate crisis do not have a voice. And that is now sort of coming back to bite us, I think, as a society. It's very interesting. Or it's, uh, when they do get a voice, it's always represented as uh, you know, bunch of hippies sort of on a corner square trying to protest yeah. because they have no other outlet to talk, yeah. you know, so yeah. it's very interesting, very interesting. And I think Olio sort of, in a way, champions those kind of thinkers and people who really want to make a difference um, in a capitalist frame of mind. Mm. Um, how do you tackle with uh, stress? And um, let's start with that and then we'll go deeper. How do you tackle with stress? Are you, I understand you are, have been raising another round for yes, yourself, right? Yes, which is ex yeah, so fundraising is yes. extremely stressful mm -hmm. and without a doubt that's the, the pinnacle, that's peak stress mm -hmm. uh, in an entrepreneur's life, especially being a female founded tech for good um, startup. All those yeah, boxes, it makes it very yeah. challenging. Um, I have realised, and I don't know if again it's, it's an advantage of being a slightly older founder, I think you have an ability to kind of step back a little bit and have the confidence to recognize that unless I am fit and well and healthy, the startup's going nowhere. And Sasha, my co-founder, feels the same way as well. So we take our personal, physical and mental and spiritual well-being extremely seriously. How that manifests itself is that, um, first of all, we're, we're a remote first company. So we all work from home. Um, everybody can work completely flexibly and autonomously. Uh, and that then enables us to carve out time in our day, generally for Sasha and I, it's during our working day, to exercise. So exercise for both of us is really, really important. And we ring fence that time in during our working day in our diaries. And when we're doing that, we know that we're actually working on the most important thing for the business, which is making sure that we are fit and healthy and have a great perspective on the work that we're doing and, and my team sort of laugh because whenever I go out for a run or a bike ride I'll be kind of stop and I'll send them an email because I have my inspiration and my breakthrough thoughts when I'm sort of technically not working when when I am kind of out and exercising so it's a win on on so many levels. It's interesting I, I sometimes have that um, when I'm taking a very uh, hot bath or shower mm -hmm. and, and I will just come out and there's just be this moment and, I was yeah. just, and I'm emailing people and sometimes I go, I shouldn't have emailed them. <laughs> but it's actually that courage or that special thought yeah, that went yeah. into it. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Now, so you spoke about stress. How do you deal with um, self-doubt? Do you have self-doubt? You might not. But if you do, how do you deal with self-doubt? Fundraising is peak self-doubt I and mean, it's peak stress it's peak self-doubt because you have a whole bunch of people who are, ex who are at the top of their game who are extremely bright extremely accomplished 
saying variants of no, no, and no, and this isn't going to work, this isn't going to work, this isn't going to work. Uh, and that is very, very challenging. Um, I once read a blog post sort of in our early days talking about how Airbnb, I think, had been rejected 30 times or something. And just actually just having that knowledge and knowing that you're not alone, and actually this is part of the course, uh, is very helpful. And actually, I also think of fundraising as being like dating, right? You have to kind of kiss a lot and, of frogs before you point. get the right that person. But true. when you do, it makes it all Worth all worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, but no, it, it's fundraising is very challenging. I'm not going to lie. And everyone tells you it's very difficult and horrific, and it's even worse than, than you imagine. Okay. <laughs> but um, it's got to be done. In your four and a half, five years so far, uh, or the four years before that when you were thinking of being a, a wannabe entrepreneur, um, did you at any moment in time have a very low moment? And if so, how did you get yourself out of it? Or maybe not? No, maybe, so I think, I think my sort of wannabe entrepreneur period in my life was characterized, actually I enjoyed my jobs. I've always enjoyed all of my jobs. I've been pretty good at them. So that was all fine, but I just had this growing sense of dissatisfaction. And I can remember you know, going on leadership courses or events or talks, and I would sit in the audience and I would listen absolutely enthralled and inspired by the lives of the people who were speaking on the stage. And then I would look at my own life and just be so profoundly uninspired. And it just started to do my head in. I was like, I'm sick and tired of being inspired by other people's lives, not being inspired by my own. Um, and that just sense grew and grew and grew. Uh, and then it was really only when I had that sort of breakthrough experience and, um, and came up with sort of the problem of food waste and earlier as a solution that, and then coupled with telling that to Sasha, my co-founder, and we need to do it together. That was sort of really the right problem with the right person at the right time in my life meant that we could make it happen. Um, I don't know. If you're religious or you're spiritual or nothing, uh, but do you believe it's destiny, luck or hard work or a combination of the few? Or uh, I think it's a, a healthy dose of all three, all three. With, without a doubt. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, from your point of view, um, how important it is to have a MVP of some sorts um, or to, to raise your very first sort of round. I'm not thinking about more sort of friend, friends and family, I'm thinking more sort of um, like a serious seed or an A round. Um, yep. How important is that? So I think you have to differentiate between first time entrepreneurs and second time entrepreneurs. Okay. So if you are a proven entrepreneur, then um, there's plenty of evidence that second time onwards entrepreneurs can go and raise a decent size round on the basis of an idea. Mm -hmm. If you're a first time entrepreneur, um, you know, I don't want to dissuade anyone, but from what I have seen, that route doesn't seem to be available and open to us. Uh, and also I think that because there are so many platforms out there that can enable you to test so cheaply or almost for free, then for the investors, it's almost a proxy of, has this person got the resilience, the nous, the creativity, the problem solving, to be able to somehow build an MVP and get some traction and get some data before they come and raise. Um, and so I really do think that you're probably wasting your time if you've got an idea and you're a first time entrepreneur and you want to raise on the basis of a PowerPoint. I think that's likely to be hard because there are often so many routes to just getting some progress underway before you, you raise capital. Um, do you think that the journey would have been easier if, or more difficult if you were not working with a co-founder? Definitely more difficult. Okay. Uh, so do you I, advise? I think, uh, yeah, I, so I'm very emphatic on this one. Mm -hmm. Having a co-founder is like having a superpower. Um, it just gives you an enormous sort of emotional support, intellectual support, I think your chance, you're probably, all the data shows that your probability of success is significantly higher if you're a startup with two, three or four co-founders. If you have too many, 
then mm -hmm. you reach the point of diminishing returns. Being a solo founder, is difficult. It doesn't mean to say it can't be done, but I would counsel that if you are at the beginning of your journey to dedicate a significant chunk of your time to looking for a co-founder who is going to complement your skill set, with whom you have a great chemistry fit and who shares your vision of the world, um, and to actively try and find that person, because I think it will increase the probability of success and it will make your journey more enjoyable. But you have to give as much due diligence into that as you would to marry somebody because it is Big decision. lifelong sort of commitment. You know? Yeah, I understand. What is your legacy? Have you thought about it? Have you or you will wait for it to unfold or have you planned it? I, I think about my legacy every day. Okay. Um, so I'm now probably in the second half of my life. I have two young children and you know, back to when I was a wannabe entrepreneur, I can remember thinking, wow, if I were to die today and look back on what I've achieved, I wouldn't, whilst I've had a great career, I wouldn't personally be proud of anything that I've done. And so my work with Olio, I consider to be my legacy, which is making the world a better place and solving one of the biggest problems facing humanity today, which is the climate crisis and specifically the role of waste and food waste within that. And that's a very, very motivating thing to do. I, I, I often say to people, I've had three zero to one experiences in my life. One was meeting my husband, one was having children, the other was founding Olio. Not necessarily because it's founding a startup, because it's working on something with purpose. And I, that's something people say, do you have any regrets? And I say, yes, my only regret is I didn't do it earlier. It's interesting, very interesting. Um, I sometimes feel that uh, entrepreneurship can be um, quite relentless. You have to be, you know, you have to be at it constantly. Um, until the time you don't have a sizable sort of bank balance, it's very difficult to action certain decisions. How do you make informed decisions um, in limited budgets? How do you do that? Well, I'm going to answer that in a slightly random way and just say one thing. You said that sort of being an entrepreneur is relentless, and it is. And in order to make informed decisions, you need to be well rested. Now, that might seem like a strange answer to say, because we generally talk about startup founders burning the candle at both ends and you know, sleeping four hours a night. That really is not the right path forward. So actually, back to the discussion we had before, it's super important. If you want to make good decisions, you need to make sure you are getting a good night's sleep and that you are healthy and happy. That is critical to make good decisions. Um, then, in terms of sort of how do you make um, good decisions with limited resources, um, I, I don't think there is sort of a magical solution to that. But the one thing I guess I would suggest is when you're an early stage founder, there's two things that happen. So one, you tend to throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall to see what will stick. And that is the right thing to do. But at some point you have to stop throwing spaghetti at the wall and you have to start focusing. And for us, one of the most important things we did to help us take decisions was to agree as a team, what is our North Star metric? So what is the one thing that we're optimizing for? Clearly, we're trying to solve a million things and improve a million things, but what is the one thing that trumps everything else? So for us, our North Star metric is the number of listings coming onto the app each day, week or month. And when you have that clarity and everyone in the team understands that that's what you're optimizing for, it helps you make your decisions. It helps decision making become um, very efficient, very focused, and pulling in the right direction. And, and you're quite right because that gives a very clear message internally and externally, um, and makes some of those investing conversations quite clear yeah. and straightforward. Um, do you see Olio growing? You're already twenty percent uh, outside of the UK. Yeah. Um, what's your ambition of the next two to five years? Well, our long term ambition. Uh, is unashamedly bold, and that is that we want a billion people using Olio within the next 10 years. Wow. Why? You know, it sounds very grandiose, because if humanity wants to stand any chance whatsoever of mitigating the worst effects of the climate crisis, that is what we have to achieve. We have to dramatically reduce our waste, 
and we have to dramatically reduce um, consumption. So that's sort of where we're heading. Um, then we have a pretty sort of clear plan for sort of a year to two years. But then planning beyond that at this point in time is pretty futile because the world is changing so quickly. We're learning so much. And I think sometimes founders can get sucked into doing too much planning that just is not adding value and ultimately is wasting time. Um, you know, a five year plan in an Excel spreadsheet. It's nothing. You know, I, mean, I don't think anyone has a crystal ball and um, yeah, no, I, think time, I don't think it's time well spent. Um, a key philosophical sort of pillar within you that drives everything around you, do you have a core to yourself, a core belief system, personally? Um, whew, that's a tough one, but I think probably everything for me orients around making a difference, a positive difference. So I think uh, for too long, so if we're changing the world has been bandied mm -hmm. around the startup ecosystem, but there are a, a small but growing number of startups that genuinely are solving really big problems that affect all of us. And I'm really proud that Olio is one of them. And so I'm very driven by making a difference at scale. Do you think that um, any sustainable business or uh, business for good should have a you know some people percentage of five percent ten percent uh percentage of, of some sort of a charity element to or oh, that's absolutely absurd i feel quite strongly about this mm -hmm. so the biggest way in which you'll be able to have impact is not through diverting a percentage of your profits or revenues to charity um because often that's very much a sticking plaster approach what is far more powerful is if your business model your supply chain, how you pay and treat your workforce, if all of those are sustainable, and if every business on the planet operated in sustainable ethical ways, we wouldn't actually need charity. So I think we need to kind of go to the root cause of things and make sure that your business has a sustainable business model. And, and that way you also take responsibility and control and have a direct effect on the outcome of it as well. You solve yeah, the problem. I, I, just, I just think that sort of, I'm going to sort of rape and pillage the planet here in my core business, and I'm going to yeah. toss five percent of my profits to charity as some sort of, you know, no, absolution. Me. That to me just makes no sense at all. It's difficult um, carbon tax things like that. Just fascinating to me how people can do that. That's brilliant. Okay, um, who? So you were our brave hustler of the day. Um, how do you define a brave hustler? Gosh, um, I think a brave hustler is someone who is relentlessly challenging the status quo and they have a very clear vision of the world that we all want to live in. And do you think us as human beings have core identities or we're actually fragmented and our core can change constantly? I, in my experience of Olio, I've, through Olio, I've met people from all walks of life and I've discovered that we have much more in common with each other than difference. And if we just take that time to connect, then it just makes the world a better place for all of us.